and clear. Okay, I can hear you well, and we have the slideshow back again, and it's full screen. Thank you. So as long as we're recording, we've got everything good. We are recording, yes. We never Excellent. stopped. Eleanor Arroway had a line like that in contact, right? Are we recording? Never stopped. Okay. <laughs> Thank goodness for editing, huh? I knew we'll you all this never happened. Okay. So here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about where this talk came from. Then I talk about the new space age and these three wonderful companies. Next up, there's a bit of a delay on the remote that I'm using here. So I'm just going to go back to using my keyboard. All right. So in the fall, I took a sabbatical semester at Citrus College, and I did a research project on how to teach estimation to college students. And the reason that I wanted to teach estimation to these folks is because I realized that a lot of the students in my classes had pretty poor number sense. They didn't have a sense of how big numbers were compared to one another. They didn't have a sense, a very good sense of how big numbers were compared to quantities in the real world. And I thought, you know, estimation would be a really good way to help people develop better number sense, develop more confidence in numbers, hopefully help some people feel like they can use numbers on a day-to-day -day basis, use them for work, use them for personal decisions, things like that. So that's why I focused on estimations. And it was wonderful. I had a whole semester to just play with ideas, just read, talk to people. It was wonderful. I felt supremely curious and I learned a lot. And as the semester was winding to a close, I started to incorporate some of the things that I had learned into my courses or the Canvas shells for my courses because we use the Canvas learning management system at Citrus. And I realized, oh, and I had two goals, uh, met both of them, study evidence teach, uh, based teaching methods and develop and share a database of estimation questions. So I don't know if any of you folks are familiar with Fermi problems. So there was a famous physicist Enrico Fermi, he worked with Robert J. Oppenheimer on the Manhattan Project, and he was brilliant at coming up with pretty accurate numbers seemingly out of thin air. So you may have heard a story about how during the Trinity test, he dropped a few scraps of paper, and from the amount that they drifted back, he was able to calculate the yield or the power of the atomic blast to within an order of magnitude or a power of 10. So that was pretty amazing. That was just one of the things that Fermi did. And he developed this whole class of problems for helping people understand estimation. Then as I got to the end of the semester, I realized that one of the textbooks for one of the courses that I teach, in fact, this is a course that Dave Molusky and I both teach at different places, but for Citrus. Uh, for the astrobiology course became very hard to obtain. So that was, this is actually the cover of the fifth edition. It was the fourth edition that went missing. And what happened was the authors had moved to a different publisher. And I think maybe the publisher had bought up all the old copies or something like that it became very difficult to obtain. So I thought, you know what? There's a lot of zero cost textbook initiatives, ZCT going on at Citrus and at other places it would be a good idea to move to a zero cost textbook now because the students would love it because they get a free book. I would be able to incorporate a bunch of the stuff that I had learned in the fall directly into a textbook and colleagues were doing it and there is some state funding for these initiatives as well. Although I wanna just put out that I have not received a penny as of yet. The problem was in order to do this, I would have to write a textbook. And the fall semester was coming to a close. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to write a textbook in eight weeks. I'm going to do it in time for spring semester. And I did it. I do not believe that I ever, you know, I, I don't understand how I thought I could do this because there was a lot more work involved than I actually thought. One reason why I believed that I could do it was because of this gentleman right here, my husband, 
who has been a professional academic editor for 30 years now. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I can write this manuscript, but if there's ever anybody who can whip it into shape and make it suitable for publication, this is the gentleman right here. So we worked together, no pots and pans were thrown. In fact, it was an absolute delight working with him. So if you ever wanna hire an editor to edit your papers and your textbooks, uh, he is available when he's not working with Oxford University Press. So one of the, so this is it. Uh, this is the book, it is free. Anyone can download it. Just ask me for the link and I will happily send it to you. It is a book about life in the universe or astrobiology. And it is a lot different than any other textbook you may have read because it is really informal. I make a lot of jokes and I'm trying to pitch it to people who do not necessarily want to be in my classroom. So I'm trying to make it super day-to-day -day and super interesting for them. So it's pretty basic for a lot of the folks in here, but I think a lot of the students tell me already that they are starting to appreciate having it broken down for them in that way. The chapter 15.3 is called Billionaires Ahoy, and that is the talk that I'm going to give to you this evening. I am going to circle back to this, by the way, at the end of the talk, because I could certainly use your help with making this textbook better than it is right now. So with that said, we're in the new space age. It's the most amazing thing. We have all these nations. We have the, the five big players in the game. Then we have all these other nations who are capable of sending ships to space. These three nations in the middle, China, the United States, and Russia, have independently launched human beings to space. And the other two on the end have la also launched plenty of satellites and other space missions like that. These nations, including North Korea, believe it or not, are catching up and also partnering with some of the bigger players in the space game. But we also now have corporations that are capable of sending people to space. And these three organizations have done it. So they have the might and the know-how of more than nations. And this is the first time in human history that anything besides a country has been able to do this. So we are living in a very exciting time. First of all, when we talk about space, let's talk about what space actually means. The edge of space is also called the Karman line or the von Karman line. And this gentleman right here, who was a real rocket scientist, was the individual who defined that. And it has to do with the speed required to maintain altitudes and things like that. So he was studying aerodynamics and he said, you know, the, the line should be about 80 kilometers or so. And he said, you know what? I'm just gonna put it at hundred kilometers because that's easier for folks to remember. However, space is not defined as hundred kilometers above the earth's surface in America because we use miles. We are that maverick nation that uses non-metric units. And so, NASA defines the edge of space as 50 miles, which is roughly close to von Karman's original figure of about 80 kilometers. So in space, the, the American definition for space is slightly lower altitude than the international definition for space. And that's gonna be important because some of these space missions that I'm talking about will have crossed one and not the other. So just remember 50 miles in the States, 100 kilometers elsewhere. Let's first of all talk about Virgin Galactic. So this is a corporation that I've mentioned in previous talks, and they are concerned mainly with sending humans to space because it's fun to go to space and people are curious and excited and also very wealthy. The, Virgin Galactic is sending 
multimillionaires, but one of the first person they sent was Richard Branson, who is the CEO of the corporation and himself a billionaire. He did this in July of 2021, and he was the first CEO to cross that lower limit for space in his company's own vehicle. So the press thought this was interesting, awesome, horrible. They had a whole series of articles on Richard Branson going to space and whether it was positive or not positive, regardless of how you feel, it is a first, it is pretty exciting. And Richard Branson finally got that world record that he was longing for, because I don't know if you have been following his career at all, but he's kind of a daredevil and he wanted to set a world record of some sort. And this was the one that he finally landed on. And the spacecraft is that he used is physically unable to cross the von Karman line. It's not designed to do that, but it is designed to go past the 50 mile limit and give folks that longed for view of the earth and that special taste of weightlessness. And that is what the people who are going to space are looking for. So Spaceship Two is the name of the design and as you can see, it looks a lot like a space plane. It is a plane that goes to space. It gets boosted up on a carrier ship called the White Knight 2. And the carrier ship has twin fuselages right here. And so here is Spaceship 2 in the middle of them. And that iteration, that vehicle itself is called VSS Unity, so Virgin Spaceship Unity. It is carried aloft by the White Knight 2. Then it is dropped. The Spaceship 2's boosters ignite and it flies the rest of the way past the 50 mile an hour limit. It can carry two pilots and four passengers. And the people on that flight get a few minutes of that precious floaty feeling as they get to the top of their arc and reach a speed of zero before they begin to fall down again. Now the VSS Unity or Spaceship Two has this interesting design feature where the wings of the spacecraft bend, it's called feathering, and it gives them a gentler ride back down and they don't have to um, deal with the G-forces and the just general craziness and mayhem of a of an unpowered drop. There is, there are many future plans for this corporation. First of all, they have to take the entire, there have been six flights within the last year or so. And the final flight is scheduled for June of this year of the spacecraft because Spaceship Two is reusable, but it is not infinitely reusable. And the trips to space are very hard on the materials. So what they have to do is they have to rotate out the vehicles consistently in order to keep it safe for their passengers. There is gonna be a new VSS spacecraft, but there may be a Spaceship 3 version of it rather than Spaceship 2. And there are a lot of folks who have bought tickets at $250,000 each per seat. So you have to be very wealthy in order to afford this ride. And we already have a thousand people waiting. New tickets are on sale for about half a million dollars. So go ahead, open your bank accounts because, you know, we all want to take that exciting rush to the edge of space and experience that weightlessness and perhaps experience the overlook effect, which is what happens when folks get up into space, they see the entire earth and they feel a sudden responsibility and interest in keeping earth a great place to live. So the overlook effect is a psychological effect that has been well-documented among professional astronauts and people who have just gone to the space station. 
and now these wonderful space tourists as well, when they go up, they seem to care more after their flight, after seeing the fragile Earth alone in space. And they seem to be more interested in philanthropy, more interested in the environment. It's a fascinating effect that all kinds of astronauts and other folks talk about. So it's as if they have a new zest for life and for helping everyone just from taking that trip to space. So Richard Branson, the CEO behind this, and he, the pretty brave soul who went up in his own spacecraft to convince all those passengers that it is indeed safe and a wonderful thing to do. He attained the world record that he's been looking for by making it past the 50 mile limit. And he has also created the first publicly traded space tourism company that is now the most popular way for non-astronauts to get to space. He is working on normalizing space tourism for the very wealthy. And of course, this may have the effect of driving prices down in the future. The, the more that this happens, the easier that the launches get. Maybe the prices will come down eventually. And he also, after this, wants to develop satellite launch capabilities using the White Knight two and also a launcher that flies instead of spaceship two so the white knight will be carrying basically a big slingshot underneath it that then propels a satellite and that and that propulsion allows the satellite to achieve orbit so it doesn't just go to the edge of space and fall back down it actually goes all the way around so these suborbital flights are for the tourists the orbital flights will be for the satellites and the other idea is point-to-point -point suborbital flight. So I don't know if you folks have read a lot of science fiction by Robert A. Heinlein, but there has, in his novels and in many other novels as well, he's mentioned the ability to take a semi-ballistic trip from L.A. to Jakarta, let's say, in a few hours. So this is something that's slingshotted up into space and comes down at a different point on Earth. So this is the type of point-to-point -point suborbital travel that is being talked about. Maybe we'll see it in the next five to 10 years. That would be super exciting. So we don't necessarily have to go to space, but you can cut the travel time to very distant points on the Earth by quite a bit. Next one, Blue Origin. This company wants to do some space tourism, but they're also working on the commercial side of space travel. They have a rocket called the New Shepard, which is named after Alan Shepard, who is the first American and the second human being in space. You can see it's got a pretty different design. It is just a rocket booster with an observation capsule on top. So here you can see it taking off soaring to the stars. The flight path looks like this. The rocket and the observation capsule both get boosted up. The capsule separates, and then the capsule descends on parachutes, and the booster touches down back on the pad where it originally launched from because the Earth has moved in the meantime, and it has flown, and the Earth has moved, so it comes back to where it was. Then after that, you end up with a similar trip that takes roughly, that gives people roughly the same amount of weightless time, but takes only 11 minutes in total. So it is a faster trip than aboard Spaceship Two. You can compare the two missions or the two experiences here. You can launch it up on rockets or have it carried up by another ship. You can land on parachutes. You can land like a plane. You can have six passengers and no pilots or two crew and four passengers. And the experience is roughly the same. However, this one does have enough power to go above that von Karman limit. So this is space in any sense of the word. And this is space in the American sense of the word. This is interesting. Here, there's a set price. Here, it's based on how much Blue Origin 
wants to work with you. So this is uh, Jeff Bezos' company. Uh, he is, of course, the founder of Amazon and other corporations. And Tom Hanks, apparently, was approached to fly with Blue Origin. And Tom Hanks turned down the offer because he says, it's too expensive. I don't want to pay millions of dollars. So he was not one of the people on their most wanted list, which is interesting because he's very famous and also has starred in a lot of space movies. And yeah, it is just solely based on how much they want to work with you. That is the price of the ticket. So Jeff Bezos made an interesting speech at one point about how the space tourism is kind of like the early days of aviation. And in the beginning of airplane flight, only the very wealthy could afford to fly. But now everyone can easily buy a ticket, almost everyone can easily buy a ticket to far off and exotic places. And he says that the more we do space tourism and similar things, the more the cost of space travel will sink. Now, this is not true if they get to charge whatever they want. So I think as this goes on, the pricing is going to have to become more transparent. Otherwise, people are just going to go with Virgin Galactic or some other company. So the, hopefully the market will take care of that. And he does want to develop heavy lift capability with a larger rocket called the New Glenn, which is named after John Glenn, who is the first person to orbit the Earth. Sorry, the first American to orbit the Earth. And the maiden flight of the New Glenn is supposed to be scheduled for September of this year. Maybe it will slip, maybe it won't. But definitely stay tuned to your favorite websites and news sources to see if that goes up. He does want to build a lunar lander. And I just want to see if the internet is working right now. If I click on this, it should take me to the page. Oh, but that's not being shared on Zoom. So I think I will navigate away from that page and navigate back to the talk. And the lunar lander is actually going to be called Blue Moon. I kid you not, that is going to be the name of the lunar lander. So that's pretty interesting, pretty fun. Definitely establishing a moon base is among the plans of Jeff Bezos and the other big ways of his corporation because they, there are lots of things that you can do on the moon that are conducive to space travel elsewhere. And also, heck, who doesn't want a moon base, right? So earlier at dinner, folks were talking about... Um, Somebody was talking about, well, we can't just send people to Mars. We have to have an economy. We have to have something for them to do. And that is absolutely correct. On the moon, we know we can definitely mine the lunar regolith and we can get rare earth elements and we can get oxygen for both spacecraft oxidizer and for life support. And there are also some other things. There's also helium-3 that we can get from the lunar regolith. And so all these things are potentially the basis of a moon economy. So at least for the moon, we have reasons for people to be there permanently. For Mars, maybe not yet. For Mars, we may have to figure out some, some reason other than we want to do it and it would be cool to become a multi-planetary species. Last up, SpaceX. They wanna be the leaders in commercial space launches and right now they are. And they also want to open up new frontiers for humanity. So these are some of the biggest dreams that I've heard talked about as far as sending people to space. This is, of course, Elon Musk's corporation. And uh, Elon Musk's biographer, who is currently following him everywhere and writing a book about him, has this interesting thing to say. He says that Elon Musk is always wrong about his deadlines. He underestimates the time required to do things by about a factor of three, usually. So if Elon Musk says something will take 10 years, it usually takes 30 years. And however, Elon Musk's response to this is, if you don't say I'm going to do it and you don't push yourself, then things don't get done. So that's a reasonable philosophy. I cannot argue with that. So the space, the booster for SpaceX is the Dragon 9. That is the smallest rocket that they have. And both the first and second stages 
are reusable. So the stages mean these are the parts of the rocket that separate and fall away when the fuel in those areas is exhausted. It helps get objects to space faster and easier. You can transport cargo within the column of the rocket. So that's the payload fairing option. So the fairing is the, um, the part of the rocket that holds the payload or the, the matter that's going to space. It can also, at the very tip, hold a Dragon capsule. So this rocket that is launching right now is equipped with a cargo Dragon, which means it is taking either a satellite to orbit or is taking material to the International Space Station. The variant of that is called the Crew Dragon. It can either take crew or it can take cargo. It is not big enough and powerful enough to take both. And it lands, I didn't finish that, on its tail fins like all those rockets that we used to imagine when we were kids. It's really spectacular. I'm sure everybody here has seen a Falcon 9 rocket land and it's just wonderful. This is, like I said, the lightest rocket, the least powerful rocket that SpaceX has, but it can make it to orbit. So it already has a capability that's far greater than either of those previous two vehicles that we have discussed. And here is here, here are the ships in terms of scale, right? Both of these are about the same. They're about 20 meters long. And this one is about 70 meters long because it's mostly fuel. You know, we need a lot more fuel to get to orbit versus just to fly up and then fall back down. So SpaceX has done an amazing job. They have done, I believe, over 100 launches last year alone. And they are planning to double and triple that launch rate in the coming years. This is just the Dragon, sorry, the Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy, which is its larger sibling that is able to boost more cargo and has a, uh, more engines and just a stronger thrust. So here is a schematic or here is a, an image showing the Falcon 9 the planned new Glenn from Blue Origin, the plan to fly in September. And here, of course, is SpaceX Starship. This is the big heavy one that hope that hopefully will go to Mars, at least if Elon Musk has his way. So the Starship is a heavy lift vehicle. And oh, you know what? It looks like I have somehow mixed up the I have somehow mixed up the, the words. Okay, so I'll just talk about it. <laughs> That'll make it less confusing. So I don't know if you folks have been following the news, but the Starship has already flown three times. And each time it gets a little farther before it explodes. And this is another sort of uh, pet thing that Elon Musk likes to say is that he said, if your rockets are not exploding on a regular basis, you're not pushing hard enough. So uh, every time it gets a little farther and hopefully the fourth flight of Starship, which is scheduled for next month, fingers crossed, will get that not only to space, but make it all the way back down again safely. So this has, the Starship has already flown successfully to space. It just didn't come back down. And we are hoping. So the, the Dragon 9 can make it to orbit. These two are planned to be moon missions. They have the capability to make it to the moon. Also, this one has the capability, if refueled, to potentially make it to Mars. So right now, one of the things that SpaceX is working on is they're working on deep space refueling. They want to send up two spacecraft, one of them that just gets up there and empties its fuel, gets refueled by something that's already up there, maybe by a planned space station that circles the moon. NASA has plans for that as well. And if so, if we can get lunar material made into rocket fuel and we can transfer it up from the moon to the lunar space station, we can refuel Starship and then send it off to Mars in six to nine months for a one-way trip. 
What do you think? Do you think that's that's feasible in the next five to ten years? It, uh, times three. It's times three, yeah. right? So it's a stretch, um, but this is this is what they're pushing for, you know. And Elon has even bigger plans than that. He wants to. So one of the things that SpaceX has already done very successfully is driven the price for commercial launches way down. It is now feasible, based on the work that SpaceX has done, for corporations to start sending robotic spacecraft to as satellites, as communications, uh, communication satellites. Corporations are already talking about mining the moon and mining asteroids based on the fact that the price per kilogram to launch it into space has dropped so low because of the work that SpaceX has done. I believe it's a, a tenfold decrease or something like that. And also definitely making humanity a multi-planet species is they have made significant strides in that area as well. Helping NASA establish a moon base, that's just in its infancy. So SpaceX has won contracts along with, I believe, Bigelow, for developing a lunar gateway space station. And also they're working on some moon base ideas. Of course, Elon Musk wants to send humans to Mars and establish a Mars base, basically because the mountain is there and he wants to climb it. He hasn't exactly said why, but he said that this is a dream of his. And he's also said that he doesn't want to travel to space unless it's to go to Mars and die there. So who knows what's going to happen, but exciting times regardless. So just before I end the talk, I want to circle back to the new book. I would like for folks to uh, partner with me as far as reading it and letting me know your feedback. The, this was completed in eight weeks. The writing is really rough in a lot of places. And I would really appreciate your help in telling me, do the jokes land? Um, do, does it sound like I'm just sort of, uh, like I'm just sort of an AI? Does it sound like gobbledygook or does it sound, you know, does the writing flow, that sort of thing? So if anybody wants to look at any part of the book and give me feedback on it, it would really help for the next edition. So I would um, happily partner with you in that way. So thanks very much, folks, for listening. I know it was crazy getting this thing off the ground, but we did it. It didn't explode. <laughs> so thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yes. How, how close do you think we are um, mining the moon, for example? It just seems to me like things would have to be fabulously expensive for it to be cost-effective to get them on the movement and send them back to Earth. It depends on how you want to use the things that you're mining. So once you, I mean, if you want to go there and mine rare earth minerals to build batteries for the moon to collect and store energy, maybe, then you wouldn't have to boost them off the moon at all, and then it would be cheaper. So you could have a whole home industry in moon-based battery making, for example. Um, yeah, it just depends on, on how you're going to use it, what you're going to use. Certainly, it's the, the cheapest way to make rocket fuel, because if you try to boost rocket fuel up from Earth's gravity, well, it's going to take a heck of a lot more energy than if you boosted it from one-sixth Earth gravity. Yeah, that means you're, you're producing stuff to use there. Than yeah. And helium three, I've heard about that, but I don't know what they use helium three for. And uh, it, um, it's light, sure. But yeah. It, and it have to be something that's awfully expensive on Earth to be cheaper to get it out of the moon. Unless other countries have cornered the market on that very important thing and the only way to get more rare earth minerals for example is to go to the moon so i know that geopolitically alliances are shifting uh 
sometimes there are allies, sometimes there are countries that are less than friendly. And so it's important to be able to maintain for national security, several avenues of access to these very important things that we can't survive without in modern society. We want to be able to build any kind of battery we need rare earth minerals. And also, if it can mine it on the moon by robots, that is way more humane than getting folks to go into these pit mines where they're subject to these dangerous working conditions and this high toxicity. Because the folks who have to mine those on Earth, they live very difficult lives. So we can have our iPhones, right? So... It's, it's not found on Earth. Yeah. Yeah, not in any appreciable quantity. Helium-3 still less so. Thing of, we wouldn't be mining it on the moon to send it back to Earth, per se. It would be mining it on the moon, so we wouldn't have to bring it up from the Earth. There's a lot of aluminum oxide, a lot of aluminum oxide on the moon. Okay, so you use a little electricity, and you separate the aluminum and the oxygen. Now you've got oxygen. Now you've got pure aluminum. Mm -hmm. And for, since there's a lot of it, you can build your own structures, mm -hmm. you know, with this aluminum yep. and use it in electronic components. Well, you could save your aluminum for the really important machinery and you could build, you could 3D print your moon base out of lunar regolith. Or you could dig tunnels, you know, because you're going to have to shield yourself from the radiation because of the moon's lack of an atmosphere. So all kinds of creative solutions are possible. So we wouldn't be sending it back to Earth. We, uh, uh, virtually everything, we just keep it there so we wouldn't have to spend a, a million dollars, you know, pretend yeah. to, you know, have it arrive on the moon. But again, because of SpaceX, that amount has come way down to the point where it's feasible for ordinary corporations to start thinking about these types of businesses. Unless Apple makes the next MacBook Pro to drive up the cost of MacBook Pro with prices even more, making the moon-based uh, MacBook Pro on the moon. If they make the aluminum shells, the, the aluminum shells will be used in the MacBook Pro. Yeah. There is one big um, obstacle to having any kind of human presence on the moon, and that is moon dust. Because unless we can get rid of moon dust, if we can keep people from tracking it into the lunar base, it will get into our lungs and it will shred them in a matter of months. So if we can electrostatically or somehow just get all the moon dust off the astronauts' boots before they come back in the house, then we'll be okay. Really? Mm -hmm. Because the Apollo astronauts only spent hours to days on the moon, and that probably wasn't enough time to ruin their lungs, but it might have been enough time to significantly impact the lungs' function based on those just spiky little tiny little particles getting inside. Um, and I've, you know, I haven't been to the moon, but I've been to Black Rock Desert in Nevada where there's this alkaline dust and that, you know, people wear nose plugs and people wear face masks and stuff like that. But still, it gets in, gets into everything. And the only way to get it off is a lot of vinegar. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, my husband can attest that I came back smelling like vinegar from the desert both times. Yeah, for two weeks. <laughs> So I've been, to, I've been to Burning Man twice. Both times I helped take an observatory there to the desert. And I can come back and talk about that for you all if you'd like. Um, but it's, it's pretty cool to have a telescope in the desert in a city that grows from nothing to about fifty to 80,000 people once a year. So that's pretty cool as well. Yeah. Picking up on what the Ron was speaking about with respect to mining. Have you read or heard anything about any plans at all in going to asteroids with the vehicles to mine the asteroids? 
that's the other thing. So in addition to driving down the cost to send anything to the moon, SpaceX has driven down the cost enough so that some companies are saying, we don't need to go to the moon. We would like to go to astronauts and astronauts, asteroids and mine those instead. And then the, the gravity costs of boosting something off an asteroid would be significantly less because they have almost no gravity at all. So, yeah. I have just a comment, too. I, I was a little bit surprised about the plan that Blue Origin has with respect to flight. They're going from basically uh, suborbital missions all the way to the moon. They have completely bypassed Earth orbit. That's have interesting. You anything or no anything about why that might be? I think it might be because SpaceX has cornered the market. But, you know, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that SpaceX basically is not for tourists. No, they, they yeah. envision commercial space flight from the get-go. They wanted nothing to do with space tourism. Yeah. But see, that, it seems like there's an open area there that could be filled by Blue Origin by, you know, getting a, a more powerful launch vehicle to go into Earth orbit mm -hmm. uh, for tourism. Well, there is, there's a corporation called Bigelow Airspace, uh, Bigelow Industries, Bigelow Industries, and they have been working on a number of inflatable modules that may become space hotels in the not too distant future, or they may become large sort of atria for the ISS or for other space stations that we send up. So astronauts would no longer be confined to these long, narrow tubes. It could be a la 2001, where the astronaut was running around the track, you know, on the outside of the space station, or astronauts are playing 3D basketball, you know, in weightless conditions. I mean, that would be pretty exciting. Certainly the astronauts would appreciate it. We're going to use the new Glenn to launch a competitor, Starlink. Yes. Yes, I heard that. Jeff Bezos wants to catch up to the Starlink network, but I'm not sure if they're going to do it. Huh? Starlink may be too far ahead. Well, they're 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 gonna they're gonna launch some stuff. They've already gotten with ULA, which uses the same VE4 engine. So it's the same engine on ULA's. A Vulcan rocket and the new Glenn, the DE4, and Blue Origin created that engine. Okay, and they've already signed up for 14 launches from the from the the, uh, the Vulcan rocket from ULA. So I mean, you've already signed. I mean, you you've already assigned. You know, told Blue Origin you need 14 launches. They had to pay him something for it just to get it ready, you know. So, and uh, China's starting to send up a lot of uh, satellites for competition with Starlink. So there, there will be over a hundred thousand satellites in orbit just doing the communication with Starlink. Passive level shell takes care of global farming. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. Too, I guess. yeah. <laughs> it was a Dyson sphere. <laughs> and, so it's not connected. And SpaceX did do a commercial launch of people called Inspiration 4. They're about to do this year the Polaris. Uh, the, one of the Polaris launches. It's a, uh, and uh, Polaris Dawn is their first one. That'll happen this year with four more people that are all commercial. And they've sent three crews, commercial crews, to the International Space Station Axiom 1, Axiom 2, and Axiom 3. Now you're saying, well, that's Axiom. Yeah, but it was on a dragon, it was on, so. You know, right now, the Crew Dragon is the only 
space vehicle that Americans have access to without asking the Russians right. to use one of their Soyuz craft. Yeah, they have to. There's only two other spacecraft that go into or, orbit with humans. One's Russian and one's Chinese. Yep. That's it. So I don't know about you folks, but I feel like we're in space race part two. I don't know if you agree or not, but worth discussing. Yeah. So Boeing has developed the Orion space vehicle, but that's slipped a number of times. Uh, it hasn't met its milestones. It uh, hasn't been... Uh, Star Star is it Starliner? Boeing, Bo Boeing Starliner. Uh, yeah. Arthur Grumman has uh, uh, Orion. That's it. That's right. Orion is NASA. Uh, Boeing has a contract with NASA to send people to the International Space Station. Orion doesn't go to the International Space Station. It's way too expensive for that. And it's built for deep space. Okay? And uh, the problem with Orion right now is the last time they sent it to deep space, they sent it to the moon and then came back and the uh, heat shield was really in bad shape when it came back. And the next launch of the Orion spacecraft is supposed to send four people to the moon, not to land, but just orbit and then back. That schedule has slipped as well. That's, yeah. Because they found some, uh, I believe they found some cracks in the Orion yeah. that they didn't expect to find. And so they have to make sure that this is going to be a safe mission. And so the crewed mission has been delayed. By I'm not even sure how long. Mm -hmm. So, Blue Origin wants to create their own spacecraft, but they're not even. They haven't. I haven't. They're very secretive, but they haven't said a lot. So, uh, they 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 need to get the new land in orbit. You know, send something, and then uh, you know they got they have to, they have to have at least three flight tests before they're even allowed to send a NASA space craft to the moon. You know, you know. But they also want to create a lunar lander for the moon for NASA. You're not on your first flight. Oh, Denise, how do we get this book? <laughs> yeah. Ah, um, I have a QR code that I think if I just stop sharing and I share my screen, if I, if I share my uh, screen, have a look at this. And actually, I can still share it. I can share my entire desktop so that folks online yeah may be able to see it as well. So go ahead and hold up your phones and see if that link works. Yep, it works from here. Fantastic. Okay. So I, uh, I encourage people to read the letter to students at the beginning of the book because it talks about the approach that the book takes. It's quite a bit different than a lot of nonfiction science books you may have read. Maybe you'll like it. Maybe you'll say, what the heck is this even? But. <laughs> is it working? I got it up on my phone. Yes. Fantastic. I don't want to save it. <laughs> well, if you like, I'll, uh, I'll send you a link. I'll email you a link. So I can uh, email Ron, and he can send it out to as many people as would like it. Yeah, yeah that works. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Thank you so much, folks. This is wonderful. Memorial Space Center in in Downey, and she told me that they had Blue Origin was doing a recruiting thing. And she told me for for about the next month or so, if you guys want to, Blue Origin left one of the uh, capsules. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, it's one of the, the flight models, but you can actually walk into one of the uh, one of the capsules yourself. For the next month or so 
And then you guys were talking about uh, Mind the Moon. There's a fantastic movie from 2009 about Mind the Moon. It's called Moon, by the way. Uh, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic movie. I definitely check it out. By the way, anyone who. The Columbia Memorial Space Center in Dallas. 